Thanks, Tony, and uh, thanks, Fred. And uh, I too would like to respectfully acknowledge the Kaurna Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered, and pay my respects to elders uh, both past and present. Uh, when Tony mentioned the, the uh, early journey which Shane, I and Tony were on uh, with IPA right in the beginning, I think, uh, late 2011, it felt like uh, Gough Whitlam being Shane and me being Lance Barnard uh, because um, IPA as a board hadn't yet been formed but we had to get on with the job and you'll recall that uh, we had a pricing framework pretty much underway and uh, some of the IPA board members are here. It was a pretty hair-raising first meeting where we were presenting the pricing framework and we asked the IPA board to, um, to endorse it and, uh, and as you know, ABF is not exactly uh, the simplest of concepts sometimes and so the IPA board were were very, very good in endorsing the pricing framework with very limited uh, time to actually, uh, to actually look at it. So um, welcome to Adelaide. It's great to see so many people here. I was wondering whether we would get uh, a good roll-up in light of you know, the difficulties of uh, public hospital budgets and, and also the changes to the national arrangements, but um, you'll hear some of that uh, over the next day. And the good news is that ABF is well and truly alive and well in Australia, um, and also uh, the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority in a in a form will continue uh, going forward. We are fortunate to have some great speakers. Uh, tomorrow morning, the South Australian Minister of Health, uh, Jack Snelling, will be providing an address um, to welcome you to South Australia, but no doubt talk about uh, the transformation of the health system here in South Australia, which is underway. This year, we are also lucky enough to have uh, Professor Keith Willett from the NHS in the United Kingdom, who will be presenting shortly after me. Uh, and Professor Willett will be talking about cost and quality in his presentation this morning. Also joining us from overseas is uh, Dr. Shule Kaluku, I hope I've got that pronunciation right, from the Research and Methodology Health Services Cost and Review Commission in Maryland in the United States. Uh, Dr. Kaluku will be covering hospital payment reform in Maryland tomorrow. It's an international business we're in, so we also are fortunate to have delegates from overseas joining us uh, from Ireland. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Croatia. So we, as I said, meet at a very interesting time uh, with health reform going on nationally but also in almost every state and territory uh, in Australia. And as health professionals you'll know um, that we're all trying to focus on how to create a more sustainable future uh, for healthcare in the future but also uh, better healthcare outcomes. As I mentioned, we know that uh, activity-based funding will be retained for a further year, further financial year, and that from 1 July 2017, Commonwealth funding to states and territories will revert back to block grants, um, uh, which will be indexed based on uh, a combination of consumer price index and population growth. Now, some states and territories, and I hope eventually all states and territories, uh, have expressed a firm intent to use elements of the current ABF system within their own jurisdiction beyond um, 1 July 2017, thus the importance of maintaining the work program that exists now across the states and territories, but also at the national level. So as far as I can see, and I think certainly as far as the IPA uh, board can see, ABF will remain an important funding tool for the foreseeable future. However, this conference is a timely, uh, a timely it's, it's at a timely uh, period of our evolution to reflect on what we have achieved nationally, collectively and what uh, lies ahead of us in so far as uh, ABF. So I'll just touch briefly on um, the context of where we started from, uh, what, what's been achieved over the last four years and what um, I and we see as the next steps going forward. <clears throat> this is uh, obvious to everyone. We've got a, obviously a well-informed audience, so I won't spend any time on what ABF is. However, the benefits of ABF, I think, have been clear. And there were some principles in the pricing framework that were established um, back in 2011, 2012, that I think hold true today. And the key words in these uh, five points are transparency, quality and access, uh, value, uh, again transparency, efficiency, sustainability, and uh, how to actually reduce waste. And there was a set of principles established um, in the original pricing framework which hold true today and which the IPA board continually go back to in looking at its work program. Again, to recap, it was established um, the national, uh, under the National Health Agreement 2011, signed by the Commonwealth, States and Territory Governments at COAG. 
and it set out particular intentions around what the roles of the Commonwealth, the states were, and thus um, what their particular commitments were around uh, submitting data and also um, um, being engaged in the ABF program. It introduced new financial and governance arrangements, and it also um, uh, had a, a very strong uh, motivation to shift away from uh, high proportions of block funding in hospitals to a greater uh, level of um, uh, variable or activity-based funding. And it, most importantly in, in this process, uh, and this is constantly, I think, a tension um, we, which we battle with at IPA, is that the uh, states and territories are justifiably the system managers of the public hospital system. And I say it's a tension because when uh, the, the sole focus of IPA is uh, the national efficient price, uh, there's always the temptation to try and use um, different work programs and also the uh, constitution of the price to, to uh, no doubt incentivise or disincentivise disincentiv poor outcomes, incentivise good outcomes. And of course that's not IPA's role. Our role is to create the national efficient price and not to actually be system managers. And it's a constant tension of working out um, how to balance that off. Again, mentioned that IPA itself was established by ministers in August 2011, the legislation passed in November, and IPA was underway by January 2012. Here's the rogue gallery, a bit of a gender balance problem we have at the moment. Uh, Jane, who's here, our, our only female, but punches well above her weight. Um, Shane on the left-hand side, I, I should have mentioned is an apology, he can't be here today, Shane Solomon, because he's, um, he's travelling overseas. Alan Bansimer going from left to right up top. Alan Bansimer, uh, Bruce Chater, Alan Morris, obviously Glenn Appleyard, Jane and, and, and Michael Walsh. Um, again, at the beginning, uh, we were very fortunate also to have, we had John Stanhope at the beginning, ex-ACT, uh, Chief Minister as well. We were very fortunate to have the mix of skills and also very fortunate, I think, to have um, uh, Glenn and also um, Alan in particular, who um, I think Glenn's still on the Grants Commission, Alan was on the Grants Commission, and uh, really, um, really drove us very hard to use evidence rather than judgment as the basis for um, the decisions that we took at IPA. Uh, what have we achieved over the last four years collectively? And I say it's not just IPA. Um, well, there's a nationally consistent approach. The pricing framework was established and that continues to be updated. Again, I would call out uh, an outstanding piece of work that was um, undertaken by Stephen Duckett and Sharon Wilcox in those early days that I th you know, really set the basis for um, uh, the pricing framework. If you get the chance to go back on the web and have a look at that original piece of work from them, it was one of the best pieces of work that I have seen in this area. Uh, there's been four annual determinations um, of the efficient price uh, over that period, which is the benchmark or price signal. We had great debates um, early on as to whether it should be an average or whether it should be a median. And, Probably all the hospitals of Australia are probably pretty grateful that we decided on average because median would have, uh, would have uh, put a quite a, quite a different um, uh, outlook on the price. However, it does raise the issue, uh, uh, it, you know, is it actually an efficient price or is it actually an average of all the current existing costs? And, uh, and so there's uh, some debate about whether it, you know, it really truly is an efficient price. Uh, having said that, I think um, um, there's been a, a gradual movement uh, of the cost, the efficient cost, or the moving the actual cost of hospitals moving towards the efficient price in and around Australia. Uh, three annual efficient cost determinations have occurred uh, for uh, block funded hospitals which are in rural areas and also there's been an uh, enormous number of refinements to classification systems uh, including um, mental health uh, teaching, training and research. There we go. This is a bit busy, these next two slides, so I'm not going to go through all the, all the components. But the uh, work program in 2014-15, uh, there's been the revision of the pricing framework for 15-16, the determinants of the NEC and the NE, uh, and NEP, ABF classification development, which has, again, uh, moved through a number of different areas, particularly uh, you know, mental health teaching, acute care, um, subacute emergency services and not admitted. Uh, development of data requirements and, and standards, this continues to be an ongoing process because there's still quite a lot of variability in some of the, uh, um, the, 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 the databases, particularly the cost database that we would like to obviously see um, greater improvement in uh, and, and the 
public hospital services cost, cost database development uh, is, is certainly listed there in terms of the NHCDC round, round 18, the, the revision of the costing standards, etc. And of course, um, an important role for IPA was the focus on uh, research and education and evaluation of the program. Uh, and uh, evidence-based ABF research is something in 15, 16 and on that we, we wish to continue to actually um, focus on. Uh, it may or may not be commonly known that um, uh, there's quite a large number of uh, countries that uh, actually uh, uh, purchase various licences from Australia for uh, the ARDRG system. Uh, we're very pleased about that. It's not um, a core revenue raiser for um, IPA. Uh, the primary motivation for this is actually to f you know, further the cause of ABF and also to uh, have robust classification systems and we're just uh, really delighted that we've got uh, relationships with a very large number of countries, some of whom are in the audience today. Uh, this has been a, a, eight has been a, a source of immense disappointment to me that we haven't, I don't think Tony, we've had one cross-border dispute to, um, to, uh, to uh, um, adjudicate on. In fact, in some ways, it's probably glad, I'm glad we haven't had <laughs> any cross-border disputes. The historic disputes have always been between New South Wales and the ACT, and I was somewhat looking forward to us being able to adjudicate one of those, but, uh, um, but in this instance, it's probably good that we've not had to do that. In many ways, uh, it, it, the ABF system may have actually um, partially or wholly eliminated some of the cross-border issues because it gives a, if you like, a common currency upon which uh, people can agree. Um, about the different uh, cost buckets and also budget um, allocations that should occur between states for uh, patients that actually uh, are located or reside or move between states. Here's a really interesting um, set of uh, data, uh, and that is the, uh, you'll note the NEP from 2012-2015 um, has been re re you know, relatively stable. In fact, um, uh, surprisingly, in real terms, as um, an actual terms for NEP 15 has actually declined in value. Um, that's actually not so surprising when you consider the cost constraints that actually the Australian public hospital system has been under over the last four or five years. And I think the NEP is reflecting um, the cost pressures and also the drive for efficiency that's occurred over that time. And you can see it here with the NWAL cost per NWAL is a significant slowdown in costs. Um, I think this represents, if I recall, about a billion dollars less per annum uh, that the Commonwealth thought that they would have to pay out based on the original projections that occurred back in uh, the Ford estimates of around 2010-11. So this um, efficiency, if you could call it that, um, I think has had a significant benefit to, uh, to budgets but is reflected very clearly in the cost per annual. Um, also, of course, there's data improvement, which I think uh, um, uh, has made a, a, a difference as well. The NEP indexation rate has declined because the indexation rate is somewhat based on a formula that reflects um, uh, the cost for uh, services and the cost for uh, wages, etc., going forward. And it's not surprising the indexation weight um, has changed from 12 um, right through to 15. Indexation proves to be quite an interesting and complex topic at IPA as well. Still much to achieve nationally. Um, I think the media uh, has been pretty good at actually pointing out over the last several months around um, the variable, um, the vari variability that occurs between uh, DRGs and between clinical outcomes across the healthcare system. Uh, IPA again doesn't have a role in uh, uh, necessarily uh, um, so solving that problem. However, uh, I think it is the more robust the data that we, we produce, the more uh, opportunities there are for benchmarking, um, the more we can uh, hope that uh, uh, states and territories and the private sector will look at clinical appropriateness and outcomes um, more robustly. I noted yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before in the financial review, the private health insurance sector uh, were uh, arguing there's a need to uh, uh, put a significant effort into uh, clinical variability within private um, uh, uh, private patients, and I think they were particularly talking about orthopaedics um, in that particular instance. So we still need to improve costing information. It is still more variable than we like it, but it has improved dramatically. We still need to develop classification systems, particularly around mental health, 
uh, teaching, training uh, and research. We have to do the evaluation of the ABF to make certain that we learn because you know, as much as we think it's been a terrific four years, um, there's a lot still to learn. Uh, and of course the obvious question of uh, how will uh, quality be reflected in uh, pricing. And we have done some work with the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality and it, uh, uh, as is always with these things, it, the thing we need to avoid is, um, is uh, unintended consequences of any pricing signals that might, uh, on one hand, uh, see, be seen to improve uh, quality, but on another hand actually uh, reduce the robustness of the ABS system um, as a whole. Uh, the national efficient price and the national efficient cost for um, 2016 and 17 has to be released in 2016. Um, it does seem at this stage that most states will continue to use ABF at some level, which is terrific, uh, and will uh, be aiming to have a new national mental health classification system in by 2016, and the development of um, uh, the research, teaching and training classification we will be uh, completing this year. Um, we, we, we're very keen on national benchmarking, and uh, um, clearly that occurs also at states and territories. Um, you can imagine with the power of analytics, the, uh, the use of the PBS, the MBS, the ARDRG system, uh, and the, op the opportunity that that now brings, I think, uh, for benchmarking and for uh, examining different uh, ways of providing healthcare uh, pathways and uh, services, I think is, is tremendous. Oops, I'm not, I'm not going to questions yet. So coming back to um, IPA itself, as announced in the May federal budget, IPA has received funding over the forward estimates and will continue to work towards the successful delivery of the national efficient price and the, and the national efficient cost determination for 2016 and 17. But ultimately, health reform relies on us as health professionals to keep focused on the key objectives um, that we need to focus on and to continue working collaboratively as we strive to make Australia's public system one of the best in the world. Finally, I, I would like to um, thank uh, Tony Sherbon in particular. Uh, for those that don't know, Tony uh, will be leaving IPA uh, formally this week, I think at the end of the week, and uh, going to a profession, an unnamed professional services firm. Um, and uh, we, we, we congratulate Tony uh, and the staff um, for the last four years. Uh, I have to say, uh, in coming on to IPA, I thought this would be hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Um, between um, IPA and the, many of the states and territories in the Commonwealth. Um, you might think it's been hand-to-hand -hand combat, but uh, to be frank, this has been uh, incredibly rewarding. And through uh, Tony's efforts and uh, your, um, your focus and the team's focus, I, I think uh, considering what a federation can do and cannot do, I think a tremendous amount has been gained over the last four years. So thanks, Tony, and we wish you well in the future. So I hope you enjoy the conference and um, I don't know whether there's any chance for questions but if you've got a question I'm happy to uh, have a go. Any, any questions anyone's got otherwise we'll hand over to Tony. I'm really kind of hoping you don't. This is one of those conferences that uh, I'd have to probably get J Tony and James to, <laughs> to answer a technical question. No? Great, thanks very much. Thanks.